chapters I'd like you to open to this morning. Okay, so it's the quiz part now. Do you know what they are? To give you a clue, it's where we've been for a long time, okay? Revelation 2 and 3. Not Titus. Now, see, some of you are turning to Titus. No, it's Revelation 2 and 3. Someone commented to me. They said, why are you taking so long in Laodicea? I said, that's a good question, which I just answered. It's the only portion of the Bible Jesus specifically wrote to us. But I said, the real question is, why didn't I take as long in every church? Because it is so vital for us to understand. I don't know if you realize in Revelation 2 and 3 what you have in front of you. You have Jesus coming back after two generations, visiting the church he founded, purchasing with his own blood. And he knows everything they've been taught. He knows the content of the inspired scriptures that they had been taught. And he does an assessment on how much of the nutrients of the living and abiding Word of God that is supposed to feed our souls had gotten through into their lives. And he shows the deficiencies, he shows the weaknesses, the the areas that need attention. So actually, in my mind, Revelation 2 and 3 are among the most critical, important, vital chapters in the whole Bible. But, as you'll see whenever we do get through with Laodicea and get on to chapter 4 and 5, we'll actually look at the ending. Did you know that, that the book of Revelation begins and ends with the comment from God himself saying, he sent this book so that the church would know what his plans are. Actually, if there's a book that you should really comprehend, God has kind of put his finger on it. Because this is the only book, Revelation is the only book that God says it's a blessing just to hear it read. You you understand that? God says if you just hear it read out loud, you're blessed. But it's the only one that, that he sent to his people to know his plan. And, and we're supposed to be a generation of people in a wicked and perverse generation that, that have a confidence that the world looks at and they say, Oh, they're having Euro crisis. Oh, we're having, you know, this, this, all this political unrest all over. And even here in America, we're having it. And we're having all this financial stuff. You go, yes, but I know the plan. I know where all this is headed. So, Revelation 2 and 3. The only portion of God's word specifically written to the church by Jesus Christ. And as we systematically examine Christ's challenges to us, we've arrived at the last church, the seventh church. And... If you had arrived at that seventh church, and if I would have been with you in the first century, visiting Laodicea was a visit that would have left you with an impression. Kind of like, you know, this morning if we were on a bus tour and we drove through St. Louis, people would be going like this, looking out the windows until they saw, which is what every time we drive through St. Louis, our kids always have a race to see who is the first one that sees the what? Yeah, the arch. And so whenever you see the arch, you know, you're in St. Louis. And I mean, you're driving around the beltway, you know, all those concentric rings of Washington, D.C. If you ever want to risk, you know, sitting in a traffic jam and get downtown, everyone is looking for the tall 555-foot Washington Monument. And, and on and on, you know, every city, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge or, you know, the you know, Manhattan's glow, whatever it is, we, we have a characteristic, something that in our minds is in that city. Well, what, what was in Laodicea? Well, the framework of Christ's words that we're going to look at, starting in verse 14, but specifically verse 18 of chapter 3 of Revelation, are built. Jesus writes verse 18, and I'm going to show you this in a moment. He writes those four phrases that are in that verse, completely attached to what anybody that either visited Laodicea or especially the people that live there. The, the three, what I call the three key industries of this town. Laodicea was known in the ancient world for three industries. Now, do you remember in America there was a time Akron, Ohio was known for tires. Detroit, Michigan was known for what? Yeah, cars. Not anymore. It's known for burned out, vacant houses and, you know, they're, they're burning, I don't know how many houses a week, controlled burns by the fire department because they just can't maintain all those empty city-owned houses and they're just burning them. Uh, but did you know 
that this city, there were three commodities in the ancient world that were emanating out and radiating out from the city that the wealthy people of the whole Roman world, if they saw that object, they knew where it came from. And that's the, the three key industries. The first one, if you would have gone to Laodicea, you would have noticed that it was a city that would be characterized by gold. As you walked around the city, you would have had a feel of a wealthy financial district type of city. Like if you've ever been to London, not all of London, the city of London. The city of London is still probably the global banking center. New York City is important, but the city of London, everyone knows it's in finance, so much of the, <laughs> the, the lending interbank rate, you know, the LIBOR rate, everything else of the key financial markets run through London. And if you go in the city of London, you immediately have this feel of a wealthy city. You go through Shanghai, the Bund, if you've ever been or seen pictures of it. It is the, the financial hub of China and the Orient. And New York City is the same. You go through Manhattan and, you know, go see the Christmas tree at the Rockefeller Center. And, and you just have this feel looking in the around. You just see banks towering over you. That's what Laodicea was like. There was wealth that was evident. Banking was concentrated. Gold was readily seen. Gold was worn by the people. Gold was available for sale, and it was used everywhere. This city was wealthy. Second thing, I mean, if you didn't pick up a little gold in Laodicea, you would have noticed the Laodicean people were wearing, and the shops that dotted this city were selling Something that, that caused people to stop and, and even ask you where you got that from. Because Laodicea was the only place in the ancient world that produced and sold a, a luxurious, exquisite black wool. And I mean, you can get wool anywhere you have a sheep, you know, just shear it and comb it and make something. This wool was like silk. And, and it was known and exported and worn and talked about around the Roman Empire because there was nothing softer, nothing more luxurious. And people, if, if they were asked wearing that, where did you get that? They would have known it was from Laodicea. It was kind of their trademark. It was sheared, processed, and sold right from Laodicea's own special flocks. The third thing, the, the key industries that we're looking at, the banking, gold, all that, this fashion district garments. The last thing you would have seen, if, especially as you came up over the hill into Laodicea, you would have seen the sprawling medical complex. Laodicea was a medical center of the ancient world. Not everything, just like hospitals today are specializing. You know, you go down to Texas for cancer and you go up to the Mayo when you don't know what it is and you go to Boston General for your heart. You know, you just go around John Hopkins for this and that there was a specialty in Laodicea. And that was that they had an ophthalmic, an eye treatment center. Now, it wasn't to get you glasses. They didn't have those yet. It was for the, the constant infections people in the ancient world had. You know how it says Paul was weak-eyed, you know, that there was something wrong with his eyes? Uh, there, there was a, a in the, the ancient world's filthiness of the travel through the dusty roads. There was just constant contagion in the eyes. And people often lost their sight from infections there. And the people in Laodicea had developed and they compounded and they carefully guarded their secret eye salve that if you had any money in the world and you had problems with your eyes, you would go for treatment to this city. This was the eye center of the world. So if you went there, you would have noticed the medical school, the, the sprawling campus, the hospital, and the specialty eye care salve. And that would have been on your mind. So Laodicea, if you were on a vacation, picked up a postcard, there would have been three things on your postcard. Gold, black, silk, wool. And get your eyes fixed here. And you say, well, what's the travelogue for? You know, we could have gone to the travelogue at Western to get that. Because... Interestingly enough, those three areas are what verse 18 is about. Jesus picked what the whole world knew about this city, and he fashioned a message to this church using something every one of them dealt in. And said, you know what? You're spending all your life on gold that's worthless. 
You can't take it with you. You're spending your whole life getting these garments that are just going to be eaten by moths and burn up and, and be nothing. And you are so proud of your excellent eyesight, but actually you're poor even though you have your gold, you're naked even though you have all these fancy clothes, and you're blind even though you salve your eyes all the time. That's what Jesus said. What, what we can say is that Christ pointed references to their city's claim of fame was what he built his message around. It, it would almost be like Jesus showing up in St. Louis and preaching about the arch. I mean, they would, they would never have thought of the arch that way. That's what he does. So look down at Christ's words in verse 18, chapter 3. I want to show you those three industries. Look at that. I counsel you to buy from me gold. There it is. That you may be rich. Verse 18, white garments. You may be clothed. And at the end of the verse, and anoint your eyes with eye sap. Jesus Christ told the church at Laodicea they needed to make specific purchases. He says, you have bought gold from the wrong source. You have bought clothes from the wrong source. You have brought your medical attention from the wrong source. Verse 18 says, you need to buy from whom? Me, Jesus said. He says, you're going to the wrong place. And as we read this passage and focus specifically on these three items that Jesus points out, Jesus said, this is the heart of your needs spiritually. And if you want to please me, if you want to not be ashamed before me at my coming. By the way, the Bible says that, that if we do not heed his words, believers will be ashamed before Christ at his coming. And we don't want that condition. And don't think it's somebody else. Say, Lord, I don't want that. And so that's why in all the Bible, there are only two chapters that are so pointedly written, not just to inhabitants of Asia Minor 2,000 years ago, but every one of these letters end with the same phrase. And, and this 22nd verse has the same thing in this chapter for this church. It says, if you have spiritual ears, if you're listening, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's to all the gathered churches of Christ throughout all time. So, we're going to do something a little different this morning. Let's all stand. And what we're going to do is we're going to pray before we read. Now, there's something. You know, teachers are supposed to vary what they do so that you're always on your toes. You know, by the way, we're going to have an unusual ending, too. So, those of you that don't like unusual things, you better slip out, you know, uh, before the end. Uh, but I'm going to pray first. And for this reason, another unique feature of the book of Revelation is it's the only portion of the Bible that says just hearing it read has a, a flowing out of blessing from God attached to it. What is that blessing? The blessing is if you hear what he says. Actually, this morning, the Lord can, can begin a process of actually doing what he asked to be done. I mean, this morning, just by listening. I don't even have to say anything. Just you hearing the word of God can actually start transforming your life. That's how powerful this book is, and especially these two chapters. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll read. Father in heaven, you have promised in your word that you attach a blessing to the public reading of your word. In fact, you've told us to give attention, that your word be read publicly. And that's why we do that at each service. We, we have a public reading of a portion of your word. Uh, specifically so that all of us together can give attention. And so, Lord, as we give attention in a moment to reading these verses, we ask that you would bless with conviction where needed, with the edifying, sanctifying, transforming power of your word unleashed in our hearts as we invite you in. And that most of all, we will not find ourselves poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked before you. You sent us a letter, specifically we'll see this morning, telling us how to stay dressed, clothed in a way that pleases you. And I pray we would want that for your glory in Jesus' name. And with your Bibles open... Follow along. We're going to read from verse 14 down through verse 18 of Revelation 3. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These things says 
the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. Wow. You may be seated. As you're seated, if you're like me, this verse should cause each of us to ask ourselves, is Jesus asking the same thing to me? I mean, as every time I read this, I think, is he asking, still asking those questions? Is he still asking me to get gold refined with fire so I can really be rich? Is he really asking me to wear white garments? Is he really asking me to have eye care? See, that's, that's the question. That's why if we have spiritual ears to hear and we see that he's broadcasting this message to all the churches, we would immediately say yes. Well, I want you to focus with me on the 18th verse because there are four phrases. This is a beautiful verse. I mean, I, I've spent my life studying and teaching the Bible. This is one of those beautiful verses that has four distinct phrases. No matter what version of the Bible you have, there are four distinct, very clearly separated thoughts or phrases that, that make up this verse. And each of these is a very powerful message. Here's the first one. Look, look at the first phrase. It is, I counsel you to buy from me. That is a complete thought right there. It has two little elements, the counsel part and the buy part, okay? And, and it, it's a very powerful statement from Christ. The word counsel in that verse is a very serious word. I'm going to do a word study with you, kind of like we do last night we had over the we invited the 36 couples that have gone through half a year of the couples in the word class. And we invite them to our house for a uh, kind of a Christmas uh, fellowship time and dinner. And so uh, I don't know, about 25, 26, 27 couples came and it was just standing room only because uh, we moved all the furniture out and stacked it to our bedroom. It was really fun. But as we were there, we were sharing verses from the Word of God. And, and this, the Word of God is counsel, but this, this word is heavy counsel. In fact, it speaks of quite deliberate, thought out, premeditated action. In fact, almost every time this word is used in the Bible, it's translated in English, plotted. Have you ever met someone that plotted to do something? Someone that is plotting to overthrow a government or plotting to rob a bank or plotting to murder this person or plotting to take over that company? Did you know a plotting person gets consumed with the plot? It's just, I mean, when you're plotting, it means that it's totally on your mind. So what Jesus is asking this church is, get completely focused on doing what I'm asking you to do. I want you to, I'm, I'm counseling you, and, and what I'm saying is I want you to completely focus on something. Now, when a person plots about doing something, it will begin to dominate their thoughts and actions. That's how serious Christ is calling us to, to get involved. Now, let's do a word study. Turn back with me to the Gospel by Matthew, chapter 26. So you're in the last book of the New Testament. Go to the first one, 26th chapter, in verses 3 and 4. And Matthew 26 is one of the four other times. It's here in Revelation 3 where we found it, this word counsel. But the very same Greek word is four other times in the Gospels and Acts. And let me show you each one. Matthew 26, 3. It says, And the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. Now look at verse 4. And, and whatever the next word is in your Bible is the word we're looking at. In, in my Bible, New King James, it says, and plotted 
to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. Do you know what they were doing that night? The, the high priest, he lived in the western hill on the, looking at the Temple Mount. There was a bridge, one of the largest bridges of the ancient world, the largest vaulted bridge ever made that went right from where he lived to the temple. And this man of great power and wealth brought in the 70 elders, the kind of like convene Congress for the children of Israel. And, and what they, look what they said. They plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. Do you know what? Everybody there focused on one objective. That's what this word means. It, you know, it wasn't they were, Caiaphas was going, how can we do it? Can we trick him? Can we send some, some person in to ask him a trick question? Or maybe we'll get someone to lie about Or maybe we'll send a temple guard. Does anybody know where he goes at night? Does anybody, maybe we can infiltrate, you know, his inner circle. Can you imagine if while it was all being talked about, someone says, I have a new recipe for blueberry muffins. I mean, everyone was said, are you crazy? We're plotting. You know, you notice that when you plot, everything focuses on, on what you're looking for. That's what that word means. Now, go to John 11. By the way, John 11, uh, verse 49. If you go to John 11 and verse 49, let me get there. John 11 and verse 49 same event, but just a little different angle. It says in John eleven forty nine, and one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Now we get some of the verbiage of what's going on in the meeting. This guy that has the big house says, you guys don't know anything. Verse 50, nor do you consider it's expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say in his own authority. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not only for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Now look at verse 53. Then from that day on. See, this verse not only gives us a little inside track of what they were talking about, but it tells us the plotting left the meeting and it dominated. Look what it says in verse 53. From that day on, they plotted to put him to death. It consumed them. If you would have been a part of that group, or if you would have seen a member of that group, it would have been constantly on their conversation. They say, do you know anybody? Do you know any way into Jesus' inner circle? Do you know, where does he go at night? How can, when is he in Jerusalem next? See, it was just from that day on. Now, chapter 18, keep going to, to the right, to chapter 18. Look at verse 14. Same time, same meeting. And it says, now it was Caiaphas who, now what's interesting this time, and this is one of the fascinating things about Bible translations, it's the very same underlying Greek word that's in Revelation 3.18, it was in Matthew, it's in, already been in John. But my Bible version, New King James says, now it was Caiaphas who advised. Now you would think that it was just advice, like someone at work saying, you ought to try that. You know, someone last night, they knew I had a cold, and they said, you ought to gargle with hydrogen peroxide. I said, well, I thought that's what I tinted my hair with, you know. And they said, no, gargle with it, you know, it'll help you. And I thought, you know, that's advice, you know, that, that you know, you think about and you decide whether you do. That is not. Caiaphas is the one that began them being completely focused on this. Now, one more. Look at the book of Acts, chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Keep going to the right. We're going to Revelation, but go to Acts chapter 9. I want to show you one more time. The last time. And it says, this is about Saul now. That, not Jesus, but it's the same word and it's the same intent. Um, Acts chapter 9, this is after the conversion of the Apostle Paul, then called Saul. He's in Damascus. And, and Saul increased more and more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt at Damascus. Do you remember he was the former persecutor? He got letters from the, the Caiaphas gang and was going all over the Jewish world uh, in the Roman Empire, grabbing Christians, followers of the way, and bringing them back to Jerusalem to be imprisoned, to be tortured, or to be executed. By the way, I said in first service, it's hard to go by that that 22nd verse without saying Damascus is a key city in the Bible. Did you know Damascus has been continuously inhabited? It was an old city when Abraham went by it 4,000 years ago. Damascus, according to history, I mean, you can look this up in the Encyclopedia Britannica or in modern day uh, foible filled Wikipedia and you'll find it's the longest continuously inhabited city in the world. 
No city has had successive habitation unbroken for well over 4,000 years into five than this city. Why do I say that? It's hard to go over it because it's in the news again. Right? Aren't they having all the stuff going on there, right? All the 4,000 people have been killed by Assad and everything. But Damascus is in Bible prophecy. And I wonder if the current effects of this rebellion going on is going to unleash what the Bible says is going to happen. You know what the Bible says? You know what Isaiah and Jeremiah tell us? It tells us that Damascus, at the end of days, is going to be absolutely uninhabited. There will be no human... Be- Do you know how many people live there? A million two hundred thousand today live in Damascus. It says there won't be a single human living in Damascus. Now, when the prophet wrote that, it had been continuously inhabited for about 1,500 years. And it's been continuously inhabited for about 2,600 more. There's a point in the future when two things are going to happen. You know what it says? Fire will come on its walls. A whirlwind will sweep around the city. And it says the city of Damascus will melt. Do you know what causes cities to melt? It happened in Hiroshima. It happened in Nagasaki. And if the Bible means what it says, I think it does, something's going to trigger Damascus doing something to God's people, who is the center of this prophecy, and when they are injured by what Damascus does, they unleash fire that melts and makes the longest continuously inhabited city in the world cease to exist. That's an interesting thought. But we're not on that this morning. Look back at verse 23. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. So, let's go to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18. Do you see the level of focus we need to have on the Lord? He says, I want you to be as focused and intent as the people chasing after Christ were and the people chasing after Paul were. That's how focused. I want you to have a plan that is so meditated upon that you are very serious. You take a planned course of action. But what's the action? What does verse 18 say that we're supposed to plot about? Buying something only Christ has. Notice what it says. I counsel you to buy from me. You know what Jesus said? I'm the only purveyor of this item, three items you need in your spiritual life. If you don't get them, you're going to be spiritually impoverished. If you don't get them, you're going to be spiritually naked and ashamed. You don't get them, you're going to be blinded. Wow. Now, Continue in verse 18. Remember I told you there are four phrases? That was only the first one. Three more are fascinating. I want to put them in context for you. Remember what you know about the first phrase. Jesus is saying, I'm constantly, by the way, the the I counsel you is in the present active indicative. Present means right now. Active means that that, that is an action that's happening right now. And indicative means it doesn't end in the Greek language. It's an ongoing present action that just keeps going into the future. Jesus says, I am constantly counseling my church from Laodicea century one all the way through until I come and take my church out of the world. I am constantly advising you that you need to come to me to get what you need. What do we need? The other three phrases. The first one, Jesus says, decide to come to me to obtain these items. What's the item? Number one, gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Now, we know from the prior verse, they already thought they were rich. You know what Jesus is saying? He says, you've got the wrong price tags. You think, you know, someone did that in Tokyo. You know, Tokyo is a big city. Someone went into a department store and took the price tags off, you know, peeled them off and put them, you know, on this true, you know, bohemian crystal leaded vase. They put 99 cents. And they took the 99 cent sticker, or I mean the, the $400 sticker, and they put it on a Disney pen. They cost 29 cents, and they put it on that. And the clerks, no one, you know, everyone just scans, beep, beep. And it was the biggest thing that all this stuff was taken by switch price tags. And we all chuckle at that, and then we think, man, I wish I, you know, (laughs) could have Christmas shop there. 
But you know what Jesus said? We're living in a world where the devil has switched all the price tags. And what we're paying dearly for, Jesus said, is trash. It's going to burn out. It's like a cheap throwaway pen. And, and what we don't think is valuable is the priceless. See, that's why he says, I say, buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Now, many commentators go on this. Some say that we're talking about salvation. You know, that is a whole view, and they can believe that. I believe this is written to the church. I believe that, that Jesus told them. He counseled them. Uh, my sheep hear my voice. He's talking and asking for a response. Unsaved people can't respond uh, until they're saved. He's talking to the church, and so that's a wonderful view. That's not how this seems to, to unfold. So he's talking to the church about something, not salvation. He's talking to them about gold refined in fire. Peter says that that is suffering, holding on to Christ through adversity, and, and the trying of our faith is like gold refined in the fire. So, again, it's to believers. But what is he talking about? Well, Jesus is saying repent of spiritual wastefulness. We, we went through that phrase last week. Jesus wants each of us to repent of using our short lives to only gain what we can lose, rather than choosing with our short life on earth to get what we can't lose, what we will never lose. Jesus wanted them to have true wealth. He says, you want to be rich? You need to be rich. Turn away from the intoxicating chase after material things. Everything that's material stays on earth. You understand? It's what you use it for and how much you send ahead. But everything material stays here. So he says, don't get intoxicated chasing after material things. Jesus wanted them to use the account. You know, when all of us were, were born again into God's family, he opened an account for us. I remember grandpa and grandma uh, on both sides of the family used to be so concerned about the kids, you know, having money for college. And so they would, they would send them uh, money f to go into their college account. Did you know God says, I'm so concerned about your, where you're going to spend forever. You're kind of in a short-term holding pattern here on earth for four score or three score and ten. But where you're headed on the trip that lasts forever, I want you to send ahead some riches for you there. And so I've opened an account there, and I've given you all the deposit slips, and you can, you can send as much ahead as you want into your account. And every deposit you make glorifies me. That's what we're sending. We're glorifying him by our response. Jesus wanted them to be sure they were investing in their eternal IRA. That's the whole idea of the bank of heaven. And we saw that last time. Now look at the next phrase. Because we're on this this morning. This is the fifth habit that he was addressing. And he says this, and white, buy from me white garments. Now wait a minute. What color were the garments in Laodicea? You know, that'd be like driving in in a big Ford pickup into a GM assembly plant. You know, or, or worse, a Toyota. You know, I mean, you know, my dad worked for General Motors. They used to just, oh, they had a special part of the parking lot that those traders parked, you know, and they'd probably key them as they went by, you know. But, but you had to be loyal. You know what the Lord is saying? You guys, you're spending your life storing, buying, making, selling black garments. You know what you need from me? White garments. That you may be clothed. And, and not just that you look nice, but look at the end of that, that, that middle phrase there. That the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. You know what one of the most fascinating moments is going to be if we ever get to the 19th chapter of Revelation? Yeah. Uh, 19th chapter says something very interesting. It says, in heaven, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we're already clothed in Christ's righteousness or we wouldn't have gotten there. But at that banquet, each of us is presented with a garment that Revelation 19.8 says are the good works Remember the Bible says you were saved for good works. Not by good works. We're not Roman Catholics earning our way to heaven by being good or any other world religion. We are not saved by good works. But once we get saved, we get to weave together with our choices 
to the glory of God and by his grace, something we're going to see. And it says in Revelation 19 that we're clothed with our righteous acts that we offered. You know what's going to be really sad? Look, look, we'll be wearing the righteousness of Christ, but look what Jesus says. If, if you don't have that, the white garment that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. That's what I think the judgment seat of Christ is about. People are going to weep because when he hands us our life accomplishment by his grace, some people are just going to break down in tears. And they're going to go, I wish you would have told me. I wish you would have told me what I was supposed to live for. And he said, I did. And they said, but I wish you would have told me. He says, I did. That's, that's why he's going to wipe away all tears. This morning, Jesus wants us to repent of spiritual neglect. He wants us to get dressed every day in a series of outfits he actually designed for us. Every day we have a choice to either obey or disobey, to either wear our uniform that he left for us. You ever see these schools where they all wear these little uniforms? You can tell the ones that aren't wearing them. It, it's amazing. He left us a uniform. By the way, look at the last phrase because I want you to feel like you finished something this morning, okay? Let's finish the 18th verse. The last phrase, the final phrase, and we're going to study this next time. Jesus says, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. This is the sixth habit we're going to see next time. Repent of spiritual blindness. See, these people had the eye salve, and the dust of the chariots and everything got in their eyes, and they'd start getting infected, and they'd pull out their eye salve, and they'd, and it'd get all better. And you know what Jesus said? He said, you've got your physical eyes seeing, and you don't realize the sanctifying work of God is the only thing that will keep your eyes from seeing less and less and less of me. Did you know when people first get saved, I see this all the time, I had a sweet little couple and I dealt with them this week and they're just so excited. I mean, what the Bible says they're going to do and if the Bible says they're supposed to do this, they're going to do that. And they just respond. As soon as they see it, they say, wow, I'm going to do that. I don't want to disobey the Lord. But you know what happens after a while? The dust of this world gets in and they just can't see it anymore. And, and it's, you know, it's kind of unclear and they go, well, I'm not sure what that means and I'll wait on that and, you know, it might mean something else and and they slowly get spiritually blinded. And the Word of God is not crystal clear. And it's not, this is the way, walk in it. They go, well, I'm not sure what the way is, and I'm just, I hope I make it to heaven. And we're going to talk about spiritual blindness. Jesus wants us to protect our spiritual eyes. Spiritual blindness is preventable. It's treatable. It does not have to persist. The first thing that happened when we were saved, the Bible says that we were born into this world lost in darkness and blind, and we were heading to the edge of a precipice. We were going to fall over a cliff edge. That's how everybody's born into this world. Everyone is born crawling along in the dark, blind, feeling their way with everybody else, headed to the edge. That's the Christmas story, by the way. That's Luke 1, 78 and 79. That's exactly what it says. And to all those crawling in the darkness feeling their way along, everyone, you know, going the same direction, it says that the sunrise, the day spring from on high, Jesus Christ rose with, with light and shined across and opened the hearts of those who would respond to him. Now, we know that they can't respond unless he draws them, but it is a, a response needed. It isn't involuntary. It's a response needed. And those who were crawling along in the darkness, he is, in fact, Wesley put it this way, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. A quickening ray. I woke, I rose, I went forth and followed thee. My chains fell off. And, and how the Bible describes it is, our eyes were opened from loving the darkness to loving the light. And you know what happens? People lose that. In fact, let me show you what I mean. Let's, let's apply this. Let's go to the book of Romans real quickly, chapter 13. Because I want to apply before we go this morning uh, our phrase we're looking at, and that is this, this whole idea of wearing the right clothes. How, how do we apply God's word? These people had neglected the eternal for the temporal. They had swapped the celestial for the mundane. They spent their lives on trinkets and trash instead of what had the right value. And that's why Jesus pleads with them that I want you to be clothed in white garments. Now, what on earth does that mean? I mean, I thought I was clothed in the righteousness of Christ. What, what, what 
am I supposed to do? What can only Jesus give me? Well, look what Paul says. God's Word describes in Romans 13, starting in verse 12, a, a commandment to wear a certain type of clothing. And if you look at Romans 13, you see, now it's interesting, and you know, I'm not teaching the Romans, but there are two ways of looking at this. Either, either what I'm going to read to you is two ways of stating the same thing, and it's just like you're looking at it from two angles. Or there are two types of garments. And you know what? doesn't matter. They're both true, okay? And, and whether it's two facets of the same thing, or if it's just two separate outfits the Lord has for us, we need to wear them. This is what it says in Romans 13, starting verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Don't act like you're crawling through life on your hands and knees, blind in the dark, feeling along with a crowd, doing the same thing, headed toward the, the pit. Stop that, Paul said. Instead, and look at the wording, put on the armor of light. Now it's interesting, Paul expands on this where? Ephesians 6, yes. And he actually names the articles of clothing, spiritual armor that we're supposed to wear. And so he says, he says, cast off. You know, see, believers, interesting, with our eyes open and loving the light, you can see believers crawling along like lost people. And what he's saying is, get out of there. Get up. Cast off that. Stand up. That's why it says with the armor, stand, stand. Don't, don't be like those feeling along, those blind people. Put on the armor of light, verse 12. Okay, what does that mean? Verse 13. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry, that's sensual pursuits, drunkenness overcome by substances, not in lewdness. You know what lewdness is? Lewdness is mocking at sin. Did you know that lost people love to make fun of sins? They mock at sins. In fact, most lost people, sooner or later, their humor descends to making fun of things that God calls sin. And lots of times they're in the moral realm. Those late night comedians, they can pervertedly talk about what God says is to be pure and holy and they, they just twist. And that's called lewdness. Uh, and there's lewd conduct and lewd conversation. Lust, the insatiable desire for gratification. Not in strife, that's never getting along with people. And envy, internal, wanting what everybody has. But, verse 14, now you see the way it's worded. Either we're looking at the same outfit from a different angle or we're presented with a second outfit. But, and notice the wording, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, how do you do that? That's why Jesus said, I counsel you. Do you know, church is not to be your, your meal. It's supposed to be the menu where you find what you need to pursue. This gathering is not to be our personal nourishment. This gathering is to be an equipping and encouraging to the personal pursuit. You know what Jesus said? Every one of us are responsible to personally plot, figure out how to, look at verse 14, how to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Okay, the question I have for you, we have 4.9 minutes left. The question I have for you is, did you get dressed today? Now, I know, thankfully, you all have your physical clothes on. But if we, could, if we could have a little black light and everybody that has their armor of light on it would glow, wouldn't that be sad to see who doesn't have it on? Who doesn't even know about it? Who doesn't even care about it? Who doesn't even know that Jesus ex is, is expecting it? Let's go to Ephesians 6. Um, real quickly, Ephesians chapter 6. Go from Romans to Ephesians 6. And we're going to start in verse 10. I'm just going to read this and I'm going to show it to you. Um, as you're turning here, I'll tell you a little story. In American history, there's one man that dominated the news industry. His name was William Randolph Hearst. He owned m so many newspapers that he made news. I mean, if he wanted it, he put it in his newspapers. He, he caused wars. He was, he was a, a very interesting critter. He was very wealthy, very wealthy. 
He had so much money, didn't know what to do with it all, so he went to Europe after World War I, and he bought all these castles that hadn't been destroyed, and he had his engineers cut them and ship them down the rivers, and he brought them all the way around to California, and he reassembled a mega castle made of components of all the best of Europe's castles. And then he filled it, because he was so rich and Europe was impoverished, with the finest Italian and German and low country art and British, every art that he could get, he bought it. In fact, he cleaned out the art market and he filled his castle with all this stuff and he made it a mecca. And everybody wanted to go to Hearst Castle in Cambria on the coast, Pacific coast in California. Then he built this road up the mountain to the castle and lined it with torches. And he would take people, his invited guests, in these open touring cars and they would drive up this serpentine driveway by torchlight and they would be let off at this mansion in the dark that looked like you were in heaven, you know. And they would be taken to their own room and when they got there, they'd find out that Hearst had done homework on them and there were clothes that were exactly their size in their room. And the person opened the door and let him out and says, by the way, you're invited in an hour to dinner with Mr. Hurst. And he wants you to wear those clothes. You pick out what you want. Come to dinner. Did you know in the history that he did this, only about two people dared to come wearing their own clothes. They weren't invited back. Hurst demanded you wear his clothes. Did you know someone much greater then William Randolph Hearst has left us some outfits. And he said, don't be naked. Clothe yourself with me. Look at, look at chapter 6. I want to show you the armor of light that we're supposed to wear. Finally, my brethren, starting in verse 10, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor. There it is. Put this stuff on so you'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. This is not the playground, but we are facing principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. There are at least four levels of spiritual malignancy. There aren't just one type of fallen angel. There are hierarchies of these. And Paul lists them off right there. And he says they are, are horrible. They're hosts of wickedness. Verse 13, therefore, if you're going out into life with, with these monsters that are, that are around, that are, that are shooting flaming darts, that, by the way, if they're shooting them and you need a, a shield to stop them, they can hit Christians, these flaming darts from the spiritual world. So he says, if you want to make it, therefore take up, verse 13, the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, and here comes the list, and, and there are six specific pieces that we have to put on. Having girded your waist with truth. This is the belt of truth. By the way, he's, he's actually, Paul is writing this, it's a prison epistle, and he's just glancing over at a Roman legionnaire. He's looking at his outfit, and he is, is drawing from what every one of them saw. He's saying, are you wearing that? He said his belt is something that held all of his, his legionnaire equipment, held his sword in place and all the other stuff. Plus, when, when he was in battle, he would pull up his, his kilt skirt and tuck it in so he wouldn't trip on it. And he says, do you know what your belt is? Look what it says. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. We live in about the most untruthful society. A man wrote a book recently, The Day America Told the Truth, and what he said is the whole country would fall apart. If salesmen told the truth, if lawyers told the truth, I mean, did you hear what went on in the Justice Department? What is a lie? Well, it depends on the intent. Either it's true or it's not. And the Lord says, get belted by truth. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Okay, there's number one. That's a biggie. And put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate protected the, the vital region here. And he says, have righteousness protect the inside of you. Don't let, see righteousness is here. Don't let unrighteousness in. Wow. What about our entertainment? We're, the, we're the, one of the first generations. We let anybody be entertained by evil. I mean, go, you want a society study? Go to a movie. Watch the previews, if you can stand it. What are they about? The occult, murder, adultery, 
Uh, fornication, we have degrees of fornication, you know, it can be a, a, a PG fornication or a PG-13 or a, I don't know all the R, N, whatever. We're entertained by evil. God says we're not supposed to even have a hint of evil. We listen to music of people who are God's avowed enemies. And we know every word by heart. He says, huh, you're supposed to have a breastplate of righteousness on that keeps any of that from coming in to your vital areas. And he doesn't stop there. I mean, you can read all this. Shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace so that you don't step on something sharp and get punctured and lockjawed and, you know, out of the war. Uh, Verse 16, take the shield of faith. By the way, a Roman soldier's shield of faith was like a wall. It was three by five feet. It was so powerful that those men, when they saw something dangerous coming, they would go into the tortoise formation where they would make a circle of unbroken shields and then put them over the top. You could run over them with, with war machines and they, it would hold because it was a metal and wood reinforced igloo of protection. And you know what he says? We all carry our wall and that wall, that shield, is faith. And that is what quenches the constant firing of the darts of the wicked one. If, you're not, if you didn't get up this morning, take your shield of faith. And by the way, it doesn't come with you unless you take it with you. So that's why it says take up. For many Christians, it stays wherever they threw their Bible, you know, and, and it's not with them, and they keep getting hit. And, verse 17, two last pieces Take the helmet of salvation, know the content of the gospel, and keep that in your mind. Know that you are redeemed and justified and sanctified and adopted and, and, and all the wonders of forgiveness. And, and don't allow constant lack of assurance. And finally, make sure your belt when you leave for work in the morning or school, you got your sword. There are two swords. There's one about King Arthur size, four feet long, and there is one about this big. And there's two Greek words. It's this one. It's the one you could really, not the one that you you know, can't even lift up. It's the one you could hold and deftly use. You know what that means? There should be a portion of this book. I can't swing around the whole Bible. It's too many, 31,000 verses. But boy, I can have ones I can hold on to. And that is the only way, look what it says, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's our only protection against our adversary, the devil. So, I told you we're going to have an unusual ending. What we're going to do now is, let's all stand. That's kind of normal. Uh, Then, I'm going to pray. And while I'm praying, I want you to think. Because before you go, and we're going to block the doors. No, not really. Before you go, you're supposed to turn to someone and, and express one truth. I believe I gave more than one, you know. Pick one truth about what Jesus Christ said to his church and you've assembled, you know, associating with his church. One truth that you are going to seek to understand more, to know better, to practice, or whatever. Because you know what we found out? It's very easy to hear a lecture and leave and forget it before you even get out to the parking lot. But if you say it, think it, express it, and someone looks at you, you'll double the retention. So I'm going to pray, and while I'm praying, try and think desperately. You know, the last time I did this, one of my elders told me, he said, you caught me off guard. I didn't remember a thing you said. I wasn't even listening. He was thinking about something else. And I said, good, good. Next time you'll listen. So uh, think while I pray of one thing. And then find someone that looks safe around you and say, you can say anything. You say, it was really long this morning. Or whatever you want to say. Just act like you talk and then leave, okay? But let's pray. Father in heaven, we don't want to just hear your word. We ask that you would stir our hearts to do it. And that you would... Just show us one, one area we can take a step to clothe ourselves in Christ, to put on one of these pieces of armor. Because if we don't, we won't stand. So we ask that you would work in our hearts for your glory and by your grace 
from what we heard this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.